this is a conversation with Samuel Barnes. Samuel Barnes is a independent philosopher who has self-published his own text um, titled Missing Axioms. I will leave a link in the description to the book um, as well as Samuel's social media information. Um, we discuss the issue of nihilism, um, self-publishing, the possibility of self-publishing, among other various topics. Um, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you like what you see, and enjoy the interview. Okay, so we're recording now. Um, okay, so let's maybe... Um, Maybe we should, the, the book is, the premise of the book, so correct me if I'm wrong in any of this stuff, but uh, the premise of the book is that they, it's impossible for us to be nihilistic as human beings. Is that, is, is that the main argument of the book? I think that's the kind of hard logical deduction of the book, yes. There's a, obviously a lot of strands that come off from that, but basically the main point is that as an embodied person, as someone who has to make decisions to the positive or negative, like nihilism, I understand the intellectual and philosophical weight that comes with nihilism, but it's it's a logical impossibility for human beings, basically. That's my point. Okay. So and also just, just to get the kind of more theoretical basis out of the way, um, is it the book kind of runs across it kind of it kind of go you kind of show this theoretical uh, distinction between explicit and implicit values that seems to be a kind of ongoing theme throughout the whole book um so do you want to summarize that just for people what this was yeah so to, to put it really simply the book is basically about the fact that what people say and do are quite different things People always, you know, extol certain certain values, certain certain things in their speech, and they go and they 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 enact and they go and do something completely different. And basically, what I'm talking about in terms of values, and it's definitely um, influenced by Nietzsche in this respect, is that there is this distinction between implicit and explicit values. So when we explicitly speak, when we extol virtues, then those are our explicit values. Like for example, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm struggling to like think of an example that isn't spicy, but um, basically someone will say <laughs> say say something, um, and then implicitly through their actions they will do something else. And this is what I'm what I'm getting at when I'm talking about embodied embodied mm -hmm. beings, basically. Um, yeah, like it um it reminds me of this is what I quite liked about Zizek when I first came across Zizek was that he was doing ideological critique from a materialist point of view, so he was always saying ideology is material it's in what you do and not what you tell yourself mm -hmm. um i think he was kind of drawing on a psychoanalytic background so if like an analyst was looking at somebody they wouldn't be looking at what the person is saying so much as what they're actually doing um the kind of it, uh, the more un unconscious expression as much as the kind of conscious expression um, i've always seen that the, the, the nature example is good too because i've always seen that kind of um that element to Nietzsche too with his critique of Christianity is often um like uh we're only repressing uh certain you know uh sins and vices because we believe we're going to get into heaven and then we can do what we want so it's kind of not really a it's not really an ethical commitment so much as it is a kind of um a kind of almost like a scheme <laughs> or something I'm not sure but um yeah so I think the book is the book is uh it's interesting because it goes across a few different themes. One is martyrdom, one is suicide, one is Christianity and Socrates. So I was thinking, uh, there's more than that, but just those are those are just the ones that kind of stuck out to me off the top of my head. Um, so maybe. I think Socrates was is, is is I think you know a good example of someone as I think he wrote in the book that he was a uh, he's a good example of implicit values, right? He's, he's someone who 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 lived and died for a philosophy rather than this kind of um, uh, simply um, explicit way. So, what is I suppose 
I suppose might, would, it, would it be a good exercise maybe to contrast the kind of modern academic or modern philosopher or modern intellectual or modern member of the intelligentsia with a, a kind of Socratic embodiment? Yeah, sure. I mean, the interesting thing about Socrates is that the fundamental crux of his philosophy doesn't come through what he wrote. It comes through what he did, which is... I think really interesting because, you know, you can be a uh, man of the people, so to speak, you know, explicitly in all, in all your, you know, uh, pomp and pageantry. But when it comes down to it, there's, there's, there's something, it's, you don't even have to be the person themselves when you, you know you're disconnecting your explicit and implicit values because there is this voice in the back of our head called the conscience which I'm not entirely convinced that every person has, to be honest with you. Um, but there is this voice in the back of the head that called the conscience. Um, and I, f I feel like um, Socrates really embodied that for me when I was writing the book. Um, it, it felt like he was almost, he was almost, he was almost the physical embodiment of the conscience. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting because it came from a, a pre-Christian world. Um, which I think with which I think sullies things in some certain way, um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's interesting. It, I was at a Julian Assange uh, kind of. There was there were protest people who were protesting outside the um, embassy, in, not the embassy, the some courts in London over his imprisonment and so on. And someone had a sign up saying. So Assange is the Socrates of of um, our time, and it actually kind of like it. it I think that's a, quite a true statement. Um, that, that like there is, and it's an extremely rare thing, right? Um, to have somebody that's that committed to a, a cause or a set of principles, whatever those might be, that they're willing to actually really suffer like that, and they had our modern Socrates in a way, but um, I think it's pretty clear when someone's deviating from what they say, obviously. Um, and I feel like anyone who's philosophically minded, it this is the conscience again. I feel like it's um, your, I feel like it's an ethical imperative for you to call that stuff out, basically. Um, and that's kind of what I feel like my work is hopefully going to be the foundation for, but we'll see where yeah. that goes. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, something that I also I've noticed in, in the extremely, in the more explicit um, sense of the word is a lot of, I was reading a, an article recently and it was talking about how these corporations had um had these like, um, uh, I, I don't even know what the exact word they use are, but kind of corporate altruism or like kind of a, uh, social um ethical crediting system so there's some companies set up like a system where they go through corporations and they set up like a kind of ethical um ethical standard and you're actually given like a, a rank or a mark i think it's more to do with climate change and stuff but there's also other things in there too i think just to do with like general social altruism and ethical progressive altruism and so on and Someone pointed out that Lockheed Martin, the arms company, is ranked better than Elon than Tesla because Elon Musk is kind of on Twitter and he's kind of causing shit with people. So <laughs> they're kind of out of spite. They've like put his company down, even though he's actually doing electric cars. Like I don't know if he's doing anything. I'm not saying he's like a savior and he's doing something amazingly great or anything. But you know, compared to Lockheed Martin, I mean, I'm pretty sure Tesla deserves a better rank on that score. So you see this, um, uh like you know the the actual um the appeal or the mere appearance of virtue is so common today and i've always kind of i wonder what you think about this but i've always had this theory in my head that it kind of acts as like a sort of indulgence or a sort of guilt appeasement exercise like these companies and these uh uh very very wealthy powerful people who want to you know continue continue to um um you know kind of live as pretty you know exploitative or um, consumer driven liberal modern individuals and they they kind of have this this schema of uh of virtue signaling and so on which is almost like an industry at this stage 
in itself. Yeah, I don't I don't want to I've I've been dying to butt in through when you've been speaking there. Um I don't want to get into the culture war stuff of you know virtue signaling all this sort of stuff, but let let's be honest about it. Okay, like Lockheed Martin has this high rating in some index, right? It's a company that literally kills people. <laughs> I don't I don't know how to put it any more like blankly than that, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, and we we've become so confused by these sorts of indexes, you know, and I, it's put very, very well by the meme, you know, line goes up, whatever, right? And we just, we just completely, we just completely means- disconnected these two sets of values. And I don't know, I think, I think it's an open question whether, whether everyone has a conscience. I think this comes back <laughs> to the fact that, you know, maybe everyone doesn't have a soul. Now, I think that's I think I think that's what the ancients were talking about when they said the the classic sorry we're talking about when they said people have soul. I don't think it's an egalitarian thing. I think that I think that some people do have a soul and some people don't. What do you think about that? <laughs> so this is a hot take now. This is a very because <laughs> our entire our entire I mean me too. Whenever I think about something like human nature or something like um a soul or a psyche i always think of it as universal like in, in, implicitly even if i don't explicitly i implicitly think of it that way so it's like so it's like i'm i'm i mean like on, on one level on a kind of biological level like i suppose it's true that we all have a psyche right um we all have a mind we all have kind of cognitive abilities to wrap the reason and so on but there is this mysterious like missing component in many people um, and then exaggerated component in other people. So you can say like Lockheed Martin, um, you know, um, uh, c- consultation managers or whoever gave them this idea of to like, you know, put them on their index and all that kind of stuff. Whoever made that index basically are people. Um, people w- like people without, I, I'm not, so, not going to go so far as say without a soul, but people certainly whose soul isn't working very hard. Um <laughs> <laughs> And These but, are people with mortgages. Have you met people with mortgages? <laughs> I don't particularly like them. They'll do anything. <laughs> mm. I'll stab you in the back for a penny. Um, but th- but there's also this, um, and I'm going to bring up Zizek again because I, I really like one of his examples where he says, uh, you go into Starbucks and instead of just being like, give me my coffee, I'm going to have it and I'm going to enjoy it. I don't care where it came from and I'm and screw you. I'm going to go back to work or just go back to do my own thing. We go into Starbucks, uh, at least in the, in the West we do anyway. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but in the West we go into Starbucks and we want to, we pay a little bit extra for having, you know, our consumption, uh, I suppose, a little bit given to a charity to some kid in Guatemala who's making the, the cocoa beans or whatever. So, or that's chocolate, the coffee beans. And um, so it, it, what's interesting about this, uh, this nihilism is that like it, today it seems to be like we have to supplement it with the appearance of virtue. It's almost like it's, it's not like that. So like, I wonder if, do you think supplementing our, 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 ni- our nihilism or our lack of a good soul is, um, it is just an exercise which makes it even better or is it kind of like fundamental like do we like it, it would seem to me that the whole system would break down if we didn't have this false appearance of virtue like if we were just honest about it it would like it seems like we wouldn't be able to we wouldn't be able to function at all which is which is actually Zizek's point in that in that argument because he says because you can supplement your consumption with like a kind of cheap form of altruism then you don't have guilt then you can consume better so there's a kind of efficiency and a kind of emotional efficiency to the whole schema. I don't know. Yeah. Like I guess, yeah. No, I I think I see your point. I think it's gone to a point where it would be it would be funny if it wasn't so ridiculous. Yeah. Because, I mean, the the death of God argument is so overdone. I understand this, but that's that's exactly what paying the extra bit for fair trade coffee at the coffee shop is. There's nothing. There's nothing more to it. That's exactly. That's exactly what that is. Um, it astounds me the number of people who are living in the West who consider themselves atheistic or otherwise, and don't understand how their their way of being and their acknowledgement of things is deeply Christianic in a way. 
Um, and they, this is just because of the void that was left, basically. Um, it, again, like I said, it would be hilarious if it wasn't so tragic. It, it just becomes so obvious. To me. It's just it's anyone anyone who who takes a second to think about it knows in every in every single situation. It's it's just like you know every single town hall in in the UK has a Ukraine flag outside right now. Yeah, that's another good example. Yeah, every every I, I, and again, I'm not I'm not even tied to either side of that <laughs> that conflict right now. Mm. But it's just like so obvious that the traditional displays of what we would call God, the cross, for example, which were replaced by nationalism, you know, Union Jack, you know, is now replaced by the Ukrainian flag. Why not? It's the current thing. <laughs> it's the current thing, you know? Current thing. It's the current yeah. thing. And, it, and the, the big question of philosophy, I think, I think, and this is something I kind of come back to in Missing Axioms is, you know, you have to have an axiom as a human being. So what's it going to be? Yeah, because th this is also something I picked up on in the book. It was um, that, um, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so it, one in one section you said uh, illusions are like hydras. So I think you're inferring that if you cut off the head of the hydra, another one comes back. So um, maybe we can talk a bit about the the because we were talking there just about like the replacement of Christian, Christian values with, um, with uh, nationalism and then with the current thing. And the current thing we could say maybe is like the Hydra's head coming back, keeps coming back. Um, uh, let's talk about more that like uh, kind of metaphysical or philosophical um, argument that you're making here with, with this uh, necessity for our all twos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically what I'm saying, I think metaphysically is that you have to, you have to have an opinion one way or the other, right? Whether, <laughs> whether that's action or inaction. Um, and it sort of, it sort of colors the whole of existence, right? I mean, I think one of the later chapters, I, I sort of comment on Nietzsche's eternal return and the sort of Christian judgment and sort of saying, you know, these, these metaphysical opinions, they have a downstream effect on who you are in the reality as we know it. Um, I'm not sure that's like a, I, again, m most of my metaphysical opinions aren't actually opinions. They're sort of, you know, just kind of considering what a metaphysical opinion would be, but I, I, I suppose I could sort of suspend judgment on all the metaphysical things that could be, but acknowledge the fact that they do have a downstream effect on who we are, basically. That's what I was getting at in the book, I think. You mean like it has an effect on how we act? It does, yeah. I mean, as, as ridiculous, you know, you have the, the common like sky daddy argument, that sort of stuff, but, you know. Eth ethics is who you are when people aren't looking you know and if you believe in sky daddy then it affects how you are when people aren't looking right yeah i think there's a i think there's a there's definitely an element of um obviously um um uh, questioning questioning our um i suppose liberal modernist view that we can dispel with all illusion and we can dispel with all irrational belief mm -hmm. um like this is again the, the hydra's head metaphor when we cut one, one thing off leads to another um so th so the axioms are missing but we need them we can't just do away we can't just do without them or is it is it everyone we're talking about here is everyone can everyone not like is it some people because like they say christianity was played uh was platonism for the masses so is it, um, I thought this is kind of a political question here too, of like um, who exactly we're talking about when it's like we need illusion or we need some sort of rational belief. Is, it, is, is, it, you know, is this a universal statement or is this for certain people or? Yeah, I mean, okay, let's be honest. So human beings, all of us, doesn't matter how smart we are, we sometimes act irrationally. 
because we have desires we have you know biological feelings that bubble up within us right that do that make us do silly things right you can be like you know iq 170 world champion chess player and i'm sure that that person <laughs> has needed the toilet so bad one time that they've acted completely irrational that's mm. what i'm talking about when i get to, when i talk about embodiment that's what i mean it's it, it's it's this very unique state that applies to us because we are embodied like the rest of the animal kingdom but we are the only part of it seemingly that can acknowledge that fact yeah and we start we we are still embodied though we still have biology we still have limitations and so on mm -hmm. um i think that, that is that what you're emphasizing yeah 100 percent. yeah and i think that's you know, I'm very critical of Christianity in the book, but I feel like the greatest lesson of Christianity is the fall, basically. The fall from Genesis. It, it's not really, you know, about the apple and all this sort of stuff. I, th I really feel like it's just a message to say, hey, by the way, you are like deeply, deeply limited and fallible. And that will, that will haunt you for the rest of your existence. And that's the story of humanity, basically. Mm. yeah so actually that is it's, it's, this could be a good segue into like maybe a little more in-depth conversation about christianity because obviously it's a theme in the book as well and obviously it's it's a theme of nietzsche's entire philosophy so um yeah i i feel i don't know i feel like on one hand i feel ambiguous about christianity because on one hand it's certainly it certainly led to liberalism in many ways, I think that like, there is an argument to be made there. And we're still living in a pretty liberal world. I mean, well, but um, then you also see these aspects to um, Christianity, which are perhaps, you know, very much useful today. In particular, I think a bulwark, I was reading Fukuyama's biotechna. Uh, our post-human future and he was kind of you know going into christianity as a uh it was a bulwark against misuse of the body so we had this kind of dogmatic dogmatic belief that like the body is a temple and you can't do this and that is what is why the catholic abortion argument is still going on despite uh, you know for, for for so long and um without these dogmatic regulations towards rationality without these dogmatic regulations towards scientific intervention and so on he, like the one of the points he was putting out is that we are in danger here kind of we, we need something we need something and you can logically lo logically deduce this something this dogma this this boundary towards what we can and can't do with the body scientifically and medically and so on so it's, it's an example i was thinking of of this of something that might come it's it, something that something that may bring forth this um uh, need for some sort of like all two without having to rationalize without having to rationally uh, you know justify it yeah i think you're right i mean there, there's there's this distinction in ethics right there's the de deontological ethics which are like you know there are like unbreakable things which you can't go against and there's consequential ethics and Ultimately, I feel like any sort of implicit action is basically based on deontological ethics. Um, you know, the the sort of when it when it okay, let, let's get spicy, okay. So when it comes to the abortion stuff, the clump of cells argument like doesn't apply for some reason to people who are alive right now, right? The same people who will defend abortion ubiquitously are also against the capital punishment why is that what's mm. going on there i think it's a case of missing action i feel like these people's implicit and explicit values are just completely out of whack you know because if, if 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 a you know a growing a growing human is a clump of cells then so is a fully born human what's the difference mm. tell me the difference <laughs> Well, 
I feel like we've told ourselves we don't need beliefs. We don't need dogmatic boundaries anymore. You know, so we, we, like everything can be progressed past. Everything can be rationalized away. Everything can be evolved, technologically evolved out of what perhaps. And it's actually hilarious because we've ended up in the least rational age ever. <laughs> yeah, this is the irony. Of it, by yeah. calling ourselves the rational people. What the fuck happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's... um. What do you think of the slippery slope argument? Because this, I feel like this is slippery slope. So that is the only, like, I understand the, you know, there's various things which are like said to be a bad thing in debate, right? And a slippery slope argument is like, oh, that's a, that's a fallacy, you know, that sort of shit. I don't, I don't describe that one bit. There is such thing as a slippery slope. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And it's not so slippery actually, because like I said, as soon as a unborn human is a clump of cells, then so is an actual human. There's not a slippery slope. It's, yeah. it's, it's quite logical. Like there's, I mean, like there's even the whole consent argument, you know, if someone can consent, then therefore that, if that is the basis for, um, for, you know, ethical justification for participating in, you know, sexual activity, then of course, anyway, and you can see this at Twitter at the moment, you see, you can see all of these, all of these culture war stuff igniting around this issue. And like, it does make sense. Like it does make sense that if, if, you know, like logically that if you can apply this to the A, you can apply it to B, you can apply it to C, you can apply it to D. So, I mean, I feel like we're in an era where it's kind of like we are without, any kind of compass we are without any kind of direct like moral direction or sense to say hold on no like this is a this is a, a boundary and and we can't just logically deduce our way leap over that boundary logically and so on um but yeah i mean um there was a quote and i have it on my phone because i couldn't zoom doesn't let you doesn't let you uh leave zoom once you're on it so i have to screenshot it and i thought it was a i thought it was a good quote because i wanted to talk about like i want because this again this kind of theme like thematically comes back into illusions and the necessity for illusions the use for illusions do can, can we can we progress past illusions and so on and so forth all these questions come up and um you had a quote which is i wish i rather like i'm gonna read it out so that illusion is necessarily connected to the tribe this could explain why illusion shattering experiences are psychologically crushing when they should be liberating as we don't approach them in a coldly epistemological manner these experiences cause all manner of existential crises disorientation and missing axioms we we don't merely lose sight of a binary piece of information or an assertive fact but all those relationships which happen to have their axiomatic foundations wielded to the collective illusion i thought that was a really good paragraph to ex to explain what's going on in the moment with all this kind of culture war stuff all this culture war stuff that it's we're talking unnecessarily about. continental style of writing that i tend to do but... i'm the same i like no i like it like i like it <laughs> I, mu I must admit though like i mean writing that at the sort of precipice of the corona bullshit and seeing where things have gone in the last year or so I don't know. I feel kind of vindicated in that statement myself. I, I, yeah, hundred percent. I think, yeah. Um, the thing that's pretty worried me about like the, the elements of that, which I quite liked too, was the tribe elements as well. The illusions are in shared often. And when I read that, like I, for a second, I thought like there was these old arguments against the mob, you know, these kind of like anti-mob, kind of like you know bourgeois enlightenment uh anti-mob writers like um oh i can't think of any names um in particular but these these thinkers that would basically say an individual isolated is is rational free from illusion and then the the mob all of a sudden where where uh we're, you know we're overcome through the collective share a bit like if you're at like a music festival or a concert or a sports event you're overcome with like you no know, you know kind of irrational behavior um but interesting thing is you mentioned covid was what really what what the the that that schema of like isolated rational collective irrational really for me fell apart because we were all atomized 
we're all super atomized and isolate literally the word isolation became such a the one of the most used words self-isolate so on but because we're plugged into these machines of collective imagery and shared like through media basically we're acting as if we're acting in this kind of mob like like a rational sense whilst being isolated i thought that was a like one of the themes which came out um of covid which i thought was quite quite interesting so i feel like we're kind of in a time where we have to kind of rethink this whole collective individual schema in 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 regards to um in regards to illusions and when we're free from them or when they take over and so on and when they should be moderated Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well I, th I think it's made clear the fact that most people are more than happy to be trapped within someone else's illusion especially if it gives the impression of security um, and i feel like for you know well i can't speak for you but people <laughs> who are minded like myself we need to find routes of escape um this is this is i think this is a something I really learned from um, Justin Murphy and Johannes uh, Niederhauser's uh, Deleuze course um, is that these lines of escape aren't for everyone basically, but we need to have them as, as free, free think genuine free thinkers, we need to have them basically. Um, and this is basically what we're, we're doing right now. You know, we're having a conversation that's, you know, extra extra institu institutional it's not it's not based on any sort of institution um i think you'll see more of this over the next 10 or so years um as you know flight basically occurs from the university um yeah i think that these institutions are basically like um only only allowing <laughs> progress within them or even participation in them anymore on the on the condition that you're fully in the cave if you have any if you have any inclinations towards escaping the cave you're just unwelcome i think i think i think that's the real problem with these institutions so um yeah i mean so this cave just getting out I, I, i'm not sure how you feel about the cave metaphor i just kind of use it as like a kind of um way to analogize uh, the at, at the very least the motivation to see past the shadows and so on um this this pursuit is not egalitarian as you were saying this pursuit is not for everybody and if, do you think that part of our illusion today is that we've thought that it is we've thought that in order for for us to get out we have to bring everyone with us yeah exactly and i again i i <laughs> it's so boring and uh, dull of me to bring it up again, but I really think this starts with Christianity. The fact that we can all be saved, it just starts with Christianity. The whole egalitarian motive and vision starts with Christianity, basically. Um, and the truth is, in my opinion, that that's not the truth, you know? Mm. I, think, I, th I think my interpretation of the cave, and it's very interesting to bring up because it... I, Every, everyone has a different, a different take on it, which is surprising because you'd think it'd be like, oh, emancipatory, let's get out of the cave. But my take on it is that uh, the majority of people are better off left in the cave. And again, that's, maybe that's my rightism coming out, definitely. But, um, you know, I think if, if someone's happier and better off in illusion, then leave them there. But, you know, we need to make these lines of escape available for people who are willing to do it basically yeah there's yeah there's an interesting there's an interesting attention there between i because one of the aspects of the cave is going back into it and there's just there's this interesting question of like why bother <laughs> like they're just going to kill you because what happens in the in the myth the, the the person the philosopher who goes back into the cave gets killed so there's this there's this um there's well this, this is so this is one of my least favorite words ever or least favorite phrases ever but, you know, you go back into the cave and you're like, by the way, those things you're looking at, they're shadows. They would call you a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's fine. Let them call you. 
they can they can enjoy their conspiracy as much as they want, but you know. Mm. I think that um, one of the reasons it's so difficult today to because like I'm I'm on your side in the in the sense that I, I do agree that that believing you know everyone can be saved is is part of the shadow and is part of the illusion. But at the same time, I do understand that kind of a sense of camaraderie or a sense of solidarity with others who you really want to save and so on. And like the question of how, how do you, how do you, how do you um, perhaps not save them in a cheap sense, but give them the conditions to uh, perhaps liberate themselves. I mean, might be a better way to put it. Um, so I think that maybe, I think the problem is today, we have a very cheap version of a uh, kind of class of, uh, and this, is, this, is, this could probably be best described in the kind of like a diversity obsession tra- uh, training programs in, in companies and, and, you know, just general advertising that is trying to inform you how uh, backwards you are the whole time. But there's this very cheap class of saviors who have taken over in the world today. And what we need isn't saviors. What we need are people to, actually help provide the conditions for kind of a, uh, some sort of self-liberation or some sort of like in, innately or intuitively motivated liberation which isn't which won't happen to everyone but will happen to a i think a substantial amount of people you know um so i think like i don't know what you think about that but i think we need to like completely redefine this whole i got this kind of it probably is a kind of christian inherited um injunction to save people i think i think that's really problematic yeah i don't know again maybe this is like like racism coming out but um the whole world i mean including the u.s government and the uk government is run by hr departments these are these are not the sort of people you want running the road like running running the whole whole thing you know i mean they have a place but for some reason, HR departments are now in charge of the whole system. No wonder it's going to shit, you know? <laughs> well, the irony is that the, the logic behind this kind of bureaucratic HR uh, takeover was the kind of post-war era. We want an impersonal state. We want bureaucratic systems where people don't get involved in any sort of like ideological or sectarian conflicts or, uh, com- or, or, or passions. We want... Um, we like we don't want leaders, political or social leaders, who are charismatic, because that's dangerous. And and, and like this is where the hatred, the kind of managerial. Well, I think anyways is where the managerial um class kind of kind of like morally justified itself. We're safe. We're impersonal. We're detached. We're bureaucratic. You know, w- there's no favoritism. There's no particularity to us. There's no kind of uh, unpredictable passions to us, and so on. Um, and the irony is that that's completely devolved into uh, this kind of like corporate saviorism that we're, we're going to educate your children. We're going to educate your eight year old son to tell him that he's, you know, privileged because he's a man or something. <laughs> like, so I think that these, I think that a lot of this stuff, I, I, I'm just like going back into the culture war again, because I'm just like using Twitter too much, but um it's also because it's, it's a kind of good empirical example of this of this of what we're talking about um but i don't know what you think about that like the the uh managerial class the hr department which runs everything is extremely like ironically i think they were built off of like regulating against like um ideologues but they've become ideologues this again this is the whole death of god argument right because you know, <laughs> HR departments are like, no, we're post like God. And then they, you know, they instantiate their own God. Um, you know, I, I, I think I always in conversations like say, oh, I'm a writist or say, oh, this is from my writers and my, you know, whatever coming up. But what I find the most hilarious is the fact that pe- people who call themselves centrists, because you are just, admitting that you have absolutely no principle whatsoever. I would rather speak to someone who's a hard leftist than a centrist because, okay, thought experiment. What is a centrist in Nazi Germany? 
and that's <laughs> right exactly exactly yeah well uh, this is this whole lesser of two evils logic because this is what centrism has, has propped itself up on for so long and, and, and technocracy it's like we're not um like we're in the center we're not ideologues we don't have any sort of uh particular political convictions or interests it's ridiculous it's ridiculous yeah. it's, the, it's the lie that you know the west has told itself the last 20 years that their news is impartial yeah. what are you talking about mm. I, I don't know if you've been looking at um... it's exactly the same topics that i bring up in my book it's like you know the things that you when it comes to action and inaction the things that you don't do for example in the news things you don't report about are just as important as the things you do report about. They say as much about you as the things that you do do, right? Yeah. And it's just, a, it's just, it's just, it's just a lie. There's no such thing as impartial news. Mm. There's actually a good quote by, Ch despite Chomsky kind of losing his mind in the past years, is there's a, there was a good quote by him back in the day and it was, uh, <laughs> is he okay? I, I don't think he's okay. He like he was dying. <laughs> <laughs> Every so often he appears on, on like a new segment with like a longer beard, like longer fingernails and like, you know, like I, I think he's convinced that like there's a nuclear, a, a nuclear fallout going on outside. Like I don't think he's left his house in like, you know, three years, but anyway, um, let's not, Let's not uh, uh piss, <laughs> piss on Chomsky too for the roasting too Chomsky stream. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he, he had it back before he lost his mind. He had a good quote, and it was uh and it was that um the the media the democratic media encourages a uh, a a vigorous debate within a very small parameters. And now if you go a little bit outside of those parameters, it's dogmatic censorship. Like you're just evil to them, you know. So there's this kind of uh, appearance of uh, of diverse opinion and of democratic values, but once you go a little bit outside of that framework, very small framework, it's pure sensorial, um, punitive, you know, exile basically from that from that, from having a platform. And I think that's exactly what you're seeing today with these tech companies as well, um, who are basically acting like you know the global overlords of what can can and cannot be said and i think as you're saying the uh the, the cannot like i think they should make a a new website i don't know who they is but a new website a new website should be formed with everyone who's banished from twitter over the past 10 years just exclusively on one website almost as like a, a badge of honor you know because as you were saying what isn't allowed what isn't spoken what is is you know as as important as what is spoken um yeah i think as someone who has a technology background i'm really excited for what is coming i mean you know it's in my nature to be pessimistic about everything basically but i'm quite excited about where cryptocurrency is going and not in terms of the, like you know the nonsense of you know Oh, let's, you know, we're all going to get rich. Let's pump this thing. Um, and Uber as well. Um, I think that the change that is going to happen and, you know, getting banned, right? Getting banned is, is interesting as a concept because, you know, governments rarely ban people. It's these technological, like, corporations that ban people. And I think, like, all change, this change is going to happen very slowly then all at once and we are basically at the beginning of the very slowly stage um so my my advice to everyone is get on get on board and get get used to the um more decentralized technologies because you know it's going to happen very slowly then all at once basically yeah no i i think i i hope you're right anyway um i'm, I'm not as technologically not, i know i'm right i know i'm right, <laughs> I know I'm right. It's gonna happen because this this can't this the the lies can only ha go on for so long, mm. and there's been there's been lies for about three years now, like just blank face lies all the time. Well, I th I think what often happens is is uh you know there's so much there, uh, there's so much repression of even any critical thinking whatsoever um, that 
within these tech platforms and so on that once something even if it's small opens up it's like a kind of like pressure it's like there's a huge amount of pressure which will flow out of it so i think once the cracks appear it'll probably will be quite rapid uh just like we were talking about with um with the kind of online um uh university stuff with the universities going to crap and you have people like johannes and justin murphy because you know they're actually doing quite well um and I, i think there's a fierce appetite for something beyond the very limited scope of the institutions and so on so i hope from a technological perspective i hope that will uh i suppose uh motivate the innovation behind these these new forms of communicate i don't know like the new forms of communication or, or transactions that you're talking about with crypto and urban and so on do you think there's like a there's like a kind of necessity of truth almost that kind of will push this uh these new platforms yeah like i said i mean the the powers that be have been denying truth for about three, four, five years now. And you can only do that for so long because truth is, you know, truth is a slap in the face, you know, it's, it, it happens, right? Um, and, <laughs> you know, it, it happens on some silly scales, you know, where YouTube does its like year in review video and it gets like the most dislikes on the platform that it's ever got, for example. That's, what, that's why they got rid of that dislike button. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. On a or like, you know, yeah. you know, the, people like Justin Murphy and Johannes are like able to pay the people running their courses more than a university would. That's truth right there. That's truth coming back with the slap in the face. And I love that. That's great. I, I also kind of think that there's a tension though, between this, this, this face slap and the ability to kind of numb ourselves from the face slap. So there's a kind of technological innovation, which goes both ways. On one hand, you have people who really want to like, uh slap and they're like so they're gonna push certain alternative outlets and then you've on the other hand you have people who really want to like immunize ourselves against the slap mm -hmm. um dig it even deeper hold them already in so you have mm -hmm. this kind of i think you have a, a tension between those two those two motivations and what yeah, worries you're, me you're right i think this is this is kind of what uh curtis yalvin talks about is you know patchwork and you know there should be like separate systems for different people and that's what i think it should be you know if you want if you want to go deeper into this deep hole then i got i got nothing but well wishes for you but just don't impose it on me you know it's like just like church and state but like blue pill and red pill <laughs> yeah basically I, i mean what's wrong with that i mean you know i, I i'm gonna go live in uh johannes and uh justin murphy's paradise i'd rather do that myself because <laughs> no, there's, there's definitely an appetite for alternatives um what worries me is the uh the very sophisticated methods of of suppressing and censoring that alternative um because you know the, even even if you're running something completely alternative you still have to go through the internet you still have to go through twitter you still have to go through um all of these platforms which are very monop very much monopolized and so on um so but you but but you know i mean i think that's just that's just warfare right that's just a part of the a part of the battle yeah i think so yeah what do you I, think I, I, don't know, i don't know maybe this is maybe this is like you know some of the christianity coming out but uh you know the good guys win in the end so there you go <laughs> i think i'm i'm the thing because i think that i'm a little bit more skeptical than that i think that if we put too much faith in the good guys winning, this is how the bad guys win because like we don't kind of motivate ourselves. We don't really, we don't really see the challenges because we kind of have this faith of, it's almost oh, like a, okay. it's, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a faith of progress. It's like, um, you know, th th there's this really, there's this quote from Sun Tzu's Art of War because I, I use the war reference there. And uh, um, it's like the only quote I know because I remember that book like 10 years ago and I didn't remember anything from it except for this one quote. And it was, because uh, it, it's all kind of oriental mysticism and like, which is, <laughs> which is cool. But like, I was just like, I just didn't remember. I just, it didn't go into my head. So but there was one quote where he said, he, he, it was like, uh, put your soldiers in a position where there's no surrender. Like they cannot move backwards or they cannot escape. And then they will fight 
the victory and only then they will fight the victory so it's like if you're kind of if, if you have like hopelessness and doom like in your face that's when in a kind of paradoxical sense in, uh, uh, the pushback is strongest so um i don't know what you think so there's that kind of argument and i, I find that interesting because it's a good argument against kind of like i think christian optimism which yeah well, I, th- I think i think you're right i think you're right but the, the the thing about the again i don't really subscribe to it but you know the christian optimism is that you know think quite quite obviously things are pessimistic right things are kind of shit and we have to like like we could we could do our best to correct them right but we could also give up you know and there's there's that sort of you know old saying of you know how how do you know if you never tried right so i would rather again it's like it's like I'd rather go down fighting than than just than just lay down, you know. Yeah, I, I find I find that because we're talking about nihilism at the start of this conversation as well, which is what the book's it's, about. Again, and, it's the complete opposite of it, right? It's yeah. the complete opposite of nihilism. I, I, it's, it's like an ultimate value in whatever happens. <laughs> yeah, I I think that there could be if you like. I think there might be something to say about like if you're fighting nihilism, you might want something which isn't either like just delusional faith in in the good guys winning but also isn't like total hopelessness that that causes you to be nihilistic and immobilizes you and crushes you you just lie in bed all day and give up and so on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it sounds like you got the point of the book (laughs) yes (laughs) (laughs) my brain is finally turning on i've like had i I, I had a coffee and it was like about 20 minutes after the coffee i was like okay now now i'm now i'm I'm on point. <laughs> I never like set out to write a primarily a theological book when I was writing Missing Axioms. I never set out to like make a, you know, a theological discussion thing, but it just happened. Yeah. I, so I, I'm not sure what to make of that, to be honest with you, considering I, I'm, I don't know. I'm not feel, I'm not like a believer or anything. So <laughs> it's weird, right? Yeah. It is strange. I think it's I think it's necessary. I think it's going to become more popular to mix in theological concepts with or even myth, mythological and theological concepts with philosophy because um because I suppose it's being I, like I think the the I, I think that it's been condemned to just be kind of ludicrous to actually take these conce- concepts seriously in the West for the past few decades. So maybe maybe it's gonna make a kind of resurgence and people are gonna see the value in them. Even if they're not gonna become like, I'm not gonna sign up to the church and become like an, a member necessarily, at least not yet. Anyway, we'll see how it goes. But um just to use them as a kind of as a way of thinking through certain concepts that are connected with philosophy, I think are rather useful. Like Kierkegaard, for example, is a good example of someone who does that. Yeah, I have I have um fear and trembling ready to be read but i haven't read it yet um i kind of got one chapter into it and i was like oh i need to like know more about the bible before i read this but um yeah i don't know i feel like it really comes back to my central points that you know these things have to be considered seriously because people have based their entire lives off of these things and you know you have to base your entire life off of something and at the end of the day you know is it worse if you base your life based off of what what christ said or is it you know is it better because you based it off of what greta thunberg has told you you know like you've got to, you've got to have a christ right well greta you've got is to have a christ in the end and it's either christ or greta thunberg so <laughs> make it <decision. laughs> that's your choices uh you got greta i thought i ah you should you should leave this in but jesus i feel I feel so sorry for that girl, man. No, I'm, I was going to say that, like, my interpretation of Greta Thunberg is this, right? It's that... <laughs> she's a victim of child abuse. <laughs> no, she's a victim of... That's child... just what I think. This like, is what I think. But not in a physical sense, in, like, a kind of, almost like a no, spiritual the... sense. It's almost, like, worse. Yeah. Because it's spiritual. It's but almost like, worse. 
on a kind of like psycho, like on a kind of functional level, what's actually going on with her is because I've thought about this, right? Is, is is that she goes into a a room full of bureaucrats who all I don't know, on some sense, feel slightly guilty or feel like something should be done to help the planet because the you know the world is going to shit. No, and they don't. No, they don't sorry, really. Want to... I, sorry, Owen, right. I'm gonna have to disagree with you here. They okay, go for it. They don't feel those feelings. I'm sorry. Well, okay. Hear me out, right? I, I think <laughs> they don't. They don't have those consciences. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, this, this, this might be where I differ from you then in in this conception of a soul and the psyche zone. Because what I think is happening is that is is that like they don't really care enough to do anything or to sacrifice anything, but they do feel this vague sense of. I don't know, like like guilt or something. I'm not saying guilt in a kind of like fundamental sense, which makes you act, but guilt in a kind of cheap sense. So what what they want is this like um, little girl to stand up. A little girl because she's not threatening. She's kind of symbolically innocent and castrated and she's not threatening to stand up there and like yell at them for like half an hour, um, which they probably pay her to do. Uh, which is this kind of sadomasochistic element to it. And, and, and like, <laughs> you're destroying the world. How dare you? You're awful. Blah, blah, blah. And then they clap her. It's like, why are you applauding someone who just tell, told you that you're like a parasite and you're destroying the world? It's like, why are you clapping this person? You should be outraged. Um, to, that's, 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 like they're kind of accepting this is what we are, but only because like what they're doing is they're then, they're then applauding a little girl. And because they're applauding a little girl, it's like, look how democratic and inclusive and progressive we are. Why would we need to change anything? Look at us in this world that's so inclusive and democratic. Even a little girl can tell us off, us big UN officials and bureaucrats. How, so, like, so like through applauding her, they're actually, even though her rhetoric is and the content of what she's saying, it's very like, you know, revolutionary in a kind of weird sense. Like we have to do this and we can change everything and you're just terrible. The, the form of signing up and applauding that and then paying her to do it and then going back and doing it again in six months is very conservative because in, in, it's, it's like explicit, implicit. Implicitly, they're saying, look how amazing this world is. Even, even a little girl can go from protesting outside her school to yelling at us world leaders. Why would we need to change anything, right? That's the- Yeah, I think, I think this is where the right gets it wrong is they assume all oh, this is all to do with like marxism or this sort of stuff it's mm. like neoliberal neoliberalism is the most conservative ideology in a way yeah it's not revolutionary in any way whatsoever yeah well it's like, it's, it's completely it, it, depoliticized but it's, but it's it's that it's that sheep uh, that wolf wearing sheep's clothing right like the sheep's clothing is going to be the netflix like documentary that's made in five years where <laughs> Greta Thunberg is like a black transsexual or something. <laughs> yeah. <I'm, laughs> I can't wait for them to make a film about her. That's going to be hilarious. That's going to be very, that's going to be very good. <laughs> I, wonder if, I wonder if they'll get the, the fetal alcohol syndrome look on her in the actor or not. Or <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sorry. I'm bullying. A, I'm bullying a, a teenage girl now. This is not. Well, she's not a teenager anymore. She's like fucking nineteen. You wouldn't know it by looking at her. Would you? Well, no. The reason you wouldn't know by looking at it is because her propagandistic, or not. I'm not saying propagandistic as in like she probably is unaware of what's going on, but like her value as a spectacle is only useful. She's a child, so her parents dress her up to be looking like an eight year old. Like so. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think it's so horrible. Like as much as I'm like being a dick to her or whatever, but yeah, oh, I just you know, you know, you gotta you gotta gotta have good feelings for these people because you know most of them are just victims of child abuse, basically. Yeah, it's a kind of it's a kind of like a cosmopolitan child abuse. Though it's not it's not like it's not like someone's gonna get home you and take, call it whatever you want, beat them around. As far as I'm concerned, it's child <laughs> abuse. Fair enough. I'm sorry, it just is. Yeah, no, I think it's actually worse. It's worse because if if you get beat, if you get beat around a bit, you know, you grow up and you can move out. I mean, it's kind of over if you, if you get used as like a kind of sacrificial symbol of like guilt appeasement for like a class of decadent world leaders. Then that's gonna stick with you for a long time. That's gonna you know that's gonna define your entire life. You're a spectacle. You're part of the spectacle now. It's great, you know. It's, it's really good, you know. Um, we're gonna sacrifice Greta Thunberg to to, to Moloch or whatever the fuck it's gonna be. Like. <laughs> yeah, fair. Do you want me to leave all that in, or 
Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. cool. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I, was I, like saying, I was saying this to um, I was saying this to Michelle and her sister actually. Like, I don't know. Like, I was like, can I call the episode "Twin Supremacy" as like a joke? But um, they were like, uh, I guess it's okay. But I was like, I don't know. I don't give a shit. Like, for me right now, like good. Any publicity is good publicity. So just just do random shit. I don't know. Fair. Fair um yeah okay well so it'll be like three sections it's then it's going to be it's going to be like talking about your book talking about Greta Thunberg and then talking about self-publishing so that's good <laughs> I like that good three good good triad the triad of uh, modern media um, yeah. awful section on child abuse yeah <laughs> why Greta Thunberg is child abuse point number one <laughs> um, you should make that a separate clip seriously that would that would get some views I think yeah okay I'll, I'll put little images of her over it like shouting at people and stuff you know um let's so let's let's go into the we we're going to talk about because obviously okay so yourself you've published this yourself and um you haven't waited around for a publishing company or of any kind academic or you know whatever um you've just done it yourself so uh this is i think this is actually a really good sign of just doing it and not waiting for someone to tell you yes you're a you're a fully credentialed philosopher now and you may speak you know like i'm just gonna fucking speak Mm -hmm. so i like that kind of uh spirit um so what i don't know i i can't think of a question but like what was it was it a was it a did you have any conflicts before you did it about like oh can i really do this is this really something i'm people are going to take seriously and so on so basically missing axiom started out as a blog and i did it like i was like okay for the next however many weeks it was how many however many chapters there are in the book i was like okay every single week i'm going to publish something on this site um and it you know it's one of those things where some chapters are better than others because, you know, some weeks I'd be in a better mood than others. Some weeks I'd be like more on the ball than others, that sort of thing. But it really became something that was, you know, very digestible. Like you can you can read a single part of it and get something from it. Any single part of it, basically. Um, and it's, it's not something that's... I, th- I think I definitely got pretty disillusioned with the fact that a lot of really respected philosophical works are just tomes of text, basically. Um, and I, I, I sort of, I still do, I still admire the ability to make something very concise and um, to the point, you know, because even, even the greatest philosophers, I mean, like I'm, I'm really deep in David Hume right now, right now. And even, even with him, you know, you're like, well, you know, I could make this chapter half as long as it is and get the same like meaning from it, basically. Um, so that was kind of my, my goal with what I was writing. Um, so like I said, it started, started out as a blog um, and then I, I sort of compiled it into a book. Um, and again, it was just one of those things where I just said, okay, well, there's these dates I'm going to force myself to do this thing within these dates. And I think, I think, you know, deadlines are really important for people. I think they're important for me. Um, yeah. You know, they stop you from wasting your life, just doing random shit, basically. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly like, cause I um, just did an undergrad BA philosophy and then pretty much decided like there's no point in going any further like like, anything i want to do more i can do myself what i did like about just being in an institution in that sense was the was the deadlines and the structure as as well as like you know meeting some people and having a drink with them after and talking about philosophy but like just the kind of the the discipline that kind of gets put on you of like you have to uh, do an essay and you have to read this text and repeat it or like interpret it and summarize it and so on there is a kind of intellectual discipline side to it and there is like a a deadline side to it too which i think a lot of people who are going the kind of more solo route 
end up failing on because they kind of they kind of lack the ability to really stick the deadlines like impose deadlines on themselves um it's quite it's quite a, it's quite a difficult uh skill to have actually to actually take that, to actually say, say to yourself i'm going to read like an hour of philosophy every day even if i'm tired even if i get home from work even if i've done this or if i've done that i'm going to do it i have to do it you're going to like let like forcing yourself to do it it's it's, it's 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 quite a difficult task um quite a different difficult habit to get into i find what you're in i think you're in but like it's, it's getting there is difficult i don't know i don't know if you found the same thing I, th- I think, to be honest with you, again, this is my pessimism and also my writism coming up again, but I think it's just down to temperament. I'm a very um, conscientious person, so I, you know, I tend to do things on a regular basis. I tend to do things with discipline, um, and I understand that lots of people who are philosophically minded don't have the same sort of temperament. So, mm. again, I'm not judging anyone based on whatever, but, you know, the way the move moving forward, I see it, you know, I'm I'm really excited for this next book that's gonna come out this year, definitely. Um, and I'm gonna keep publishing every single year. I'm gonna do a book. So there you go. Nice. I think yeah, definitely. I think I think temperament does play a even role. If it's, even if it's shit, you know, I don't care. I don't care if anything is like you know. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I find like going. like I haven't published all book, but I, I have a kind of similar self-imposed discipline where I'm like, okay, I gotta read like. You gotta either read or write, say like an hour every day, and like, um, um, and I have to, you know, and if, if I have an idea, it's like, okay, I want to get this done, and I may, maybe I'll stay up later one night, maybe I'll uh, refrain from doing other things. Like, for example, I could just play some Xbox, and I'm like, no, I'm just gonna do this. I could, um, you know, I don't know, I could just distract myself watching YouTube videos, and I kind of feel, I kind of feel like a certain a kind of like healthy sense of guilt comes out when I do this stuff in the sense that it's like, well, what have you really going to, like, if you write some philosophy books that you've really accomplished something with your life. I mean, you've really done something. If you just play some Xbox games when you get home from work, you know what I mean? Like it's not memorable in any way. It's not, uh, it's not beneficial. You're not, you're not leaving anything behind. So I kind of find that kind of like a healthy sense of guilt. Um, um, it, it, it is a good motivation, which, which very much goes against the kind of, uh, um, liberal um injunctions towards like you know just let's, relax let's, enjoy let's yourself here for a second because i i'm i'm interested in your response to this because i'm very public about the fact that i am who i am i i do everything in my own name for example um i'm you know maybe i have some spicy opinions but i do it all in my own name um i i think a big part that was stopping me from doing stuff was a fear like a fear of what other people would think for example like you know what what would my mum think if she read certain parts of my book what would my grandma think if she read certain parts of my books what would my best friend think if if she read certain parts of my book um and and you generally are you know you're you're under a pseudonym generally speaking online what what's the drive behind that because for me i'm almost like radical honesty you know just i just want I don't, like it's not even a want it's just like well okay this is a thing i've been scared to do it for so long now let's just go all right but w- what's your kind of uh reason for the moniker the the raymond k hessel thing like what's, what's um it, it, it's it's i like anonymity just because the thing is like you know like people know my whenever i talk to anyone personally i always just tell them my real name and like um i've written under my real name in the kind of student um uh well, not like a student but a kind of uh it was made by a student kind of a journal um called the mallard i don't know if you've heard of it but it's uh uh yeah i mean like i've written on my real name I, i've not i'm not like hiding it it was just like when i originally made it i was kind of like i was going off into a different personality you know like 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 if you're writing i find it's it's almost like i'm going to become something which is kind of i can't express in like my daily my day-to-day interactions kind of my normal civil persona is uh won't do i need raymond i need raymond to take over and he needs to do with the writing and so on you know so i think it's kind of it's not really it's not really like a uh protecting an identity thing so much as like a kind of uh going into a different persona and to be honest with you if i ever published anything i'd probably 
do my real name and then plus Ray McKay, uh, I aka Ray McKay. So like, um, I think I think I also it also kind of fed into the whole online uh, anonymous shit poster culture as well. I think that just kind of is um something I found a little bit liberating, which does feed into like what a fear of what people will think of this and that and so on. But at the end of the day, like you know, whenever people ask me my opinions, even if they're like friends that are very like indifferent politically to me, I always I always I always give them my honest opinion. Um, but I kind of then again avoid discussing things with people that I just know they're just feeding, they're just drinking the Kool Aid, they're just with the current mm-hmm. thing. I'm kind of I'm kind of done with it. I'm kind of like, you know, I kind of used to like debate people or argue with people. I just kind of got fed up. So well, I was just you like, being really my... logical about that. You're like, well, there's literally nothing I can say to change your opinion. So That's it. Yeah. Simple, right. Like... Yeah. And it, it it made it always made me like quite a kind of nihilistic and like feel like I'm feel quite hopeless about things when people were just so when you were talking to people and it was there was just such a, a, a wall there um such a such kind of dogmatism and so on I found that that the energy you put into that you could just be saying I don't care what you think I'm just going to put it into something that you're doing in a much more alienated and private way you know <laughs> redirecting that energy I suppose Yeah, I I think this is what I was getting at in the book, basically, is that, you know, (laughs) there's a difference between what we say and what we do. And uh, I don't know, I I think I still have an issue with the whole, like, like, or even pseudonym online sort of stuff. I I think it's inherently cowardly, myself. Like, I I don't know, I'm not, like, a complete, like, shitpost or anything, but, like... If I've got something to say, I'll just say it and I'll be like, okay, this is what I said under my own name. Maybe I'm like fame hungry or something, but I almost want the attention. But maybe well, I'll regret that later on. Let, let's see. Well, what you see, <laughs> there is an element of that too. It's kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, this isn't like making, having a pseudonym in that sense is, uh, it's like, it's not me. It's not my personal like uh achievement it's like it's 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 about the it's about the work it's about the theory it's about the philosophy it's not it's not something that's about me um and and the pseudonym kind of distances you as in a personal sense from um what it is you know so i suppose there is a kind of there is a there is an ethical argument to be made in that sense for it um and I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I, th- I think just me personally, I've been such a like big personality in some people's lives that um, I almost have like two or three personalities within myself anyway. So it doesn't like, <laughs> I don't really need like a pseudonym. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll probably drop the pseudonym eventually anyway, but you know. You should, you should be honest. Fair enough. Um, uh, one thing I noticed, one thing that I told myself that, that I was going to do originally was that I was like, even if I don't get anything published by like a mainstream publisher or anything like that, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a PhD almost like, almost like in my mind, it was like, it was like, you can't even self-publish without a PhD because it's almost absurd. Uh, and it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't until like last year where I kind of thought, no, that's kind of stupid. Like, why would I ever think, why would I ever think that, you know? Cause like, you don't have a PhD. I'm, I'm, am I, you, you, you don't have to say it if you don't want it. <laughs> but like, I you, do not have a PhD. You no, peasant, you PhD. pleb, you I know. fraud. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like there was, I always had this kind of uh, feel, feeling, I don't know if you had the same thing of like, how could I publish a philosophy book without at, at least having a PhD? Did you get the same kind of a uh, in- feeling of inhibition there, or no? It, it's not at all. I mean, the straight the strangest thing about self publishing is that you realize that no one had to tell you to do the thing that you were going to do before you did it. Right? Like, it turns out it turns out that for most things in life, you don't really need permission to do them. You just do them because you are the person you are. Right. And this, yeah. again, this is the fear. This is the fear. Most people live their lives in complete fear. Complete fear. Like, complete fear of, I don't even know what of, but they're just fearful people, you know? Um, 
And I, I don't know. I just kind of figured I was, especially especially because the Missy Action came out like uh, eight months ago and it was like the depths of the corona panic. And in a time where people were incredibly fearful, I was like the least fearful I've ever been in my entire life. I think I think I think the kind of culture sent me the other direction. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But you know, um, well, this this is what's happening at the moment. I think in general that there's a there's a kind of I think a healthy polarization. I think that like people always talk about polarization in a negative sense, don't they? Things are polarized, conflict, blah blah blah. Whereas I think I think that um, the conditions we're living in today really do tend towards a polarization in, in in a good sense right because there's no more there's, there's no like if you're in the institution for example or you're outside the institution take that one distinction if you're in an institution it's generally because you are fearful but you're not good you're not going to survive and, and in that institution and be honest if it's an academic institution or like a media institution i'm not saying every institution but these ones in particular um, so the ones on the outside, I mean, just by necessity of who they are and who they're trying to be, you're going to be pushed out. You're going to have to or, or take yourself out in order to actually achieve anything or actually do anything. So um, I think that COVID was the same thing for me. I think it was like, um, I just, I, I was almost like, ref, I was, had a sense of inhibition. It's like, I won't, I'm not going to write anything or make any videos until maybe another few years or I'll think about it. And then it was like, I don't know, like there's so much, there's so much fear out there. There's just so much um, drinking the Kool-Aid. There's so much following the current thing. And I had all these ideas and thoughts in my head and I was like, no one's saying them. And even the philosophers I would normally look up to and wait, kind of get their opinion. I was like, they're not even saying anything like, okay, now there's an ethical urgency. Now you have to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't... That's that's the um, that's the Socratic conscience coming coming out to you, I think, mm. and that's not something that everyone has in their in their body. You know, I feel like you have this, but you you know, other people don't have this. Basically, <laughs> um... we're back to the the particularity of this of this uh, uh, component or this faculty, which well, is part. It's just you know, it's just, it's just for me. It's just you know. The, the writers and coming out and being like some people are better than other people <laughs> <laughs> basically yeah you know <laughs> but like it, 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 it like it entirely it entirely depends on how we formulate like better because it's like it's like be okay better in this is this is the thing this is uh not a chapter from my next book but there's definitely an article i want to write is that better is the worst word in the english language and they, okay. this is definitely a concession to the relativists, basically, is that, you know, better is just a, sh it's just a crap word. It's like, oh, this thing is better. Oh, this, this MacBook is better. It's just, it's just a gloss over every, everything that's like not thought about. So, oh, it's better. It's faster, whatever. Hmm. It doesn't think it does better. doesn't think about anything. That's the problem with better. Yeah, well, better generally takes a kind of um, pre-ordained, pre-given direction and just follows it. Yeah, follows it. Better, better is like novelty, distilled progressivism. Like yeah. better in, implies that things are going to get better. Mm. The word better implies that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, this it, it's it, it it's a really interesting it's a really interesting kind of um, revelation to have. And I think I used to be more like left inclined. So it was some, maybe somewhat difficult for me to, to come to terms with as well, but how there is this radical distinction, as you were saying, between some people have this faculty where it's like they have this Socratic conscience or um, um, courage, ethical aspirations or in, in some form or another some people don't like it is it is one of the most mysterious aspects of human beings as absolutely fascinating because most other animals for example 
generally have about the same like if you get like chimpanzees or uh whatever giraffes or whatever animal right they generally have the same amount of <laughs> giraffes chimpanzees uh <laughs> giraffes is a weird one giraffes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, I was, after he said it, I was like, that's a really strange example. Just go on it. Just go on it. Uh, <laughs> it's too late. It's too late. I've said it. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, th th there's a general standard of courage. There's a general standard of of uh, of physical strength. There's a general, well, at least for like the most like biggest, you know, like a, an adult male in his prime of this animal is going to be very similar to an adult male in his prime. Of the same species where with human beings we have this massive distinction uh in terms of competency courage intellectual ca capacity uh, athletic capacity creative capacity and so on we just we just have this so much massive distinctions between, between each other that it's very hard to kind of say humans in a very universal sense like human being is this human being is that and I, I have a feeling that this may be one of the one of the dogmas of progress basically that we're going to have to be forced to uh, reevaluate in the next in the next few years, in this century, perhaps. It's a large philosophical question. I know it's it's a huge topic. Maybe we shouldn't go into it, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I, th I think it's interesting because um... I, I I also think it's kind so, of about... so. Here, here's the thing, my my. Again, to get away from the sort of me just being belligerent or whatever. My issue with the word better is it doesn't acknowledge it doesn't acknowledge a criteria by which things are better. Okay. It's almost ahead. like utilitarian in, in inherently utilitarian in the way it's spoken, but it's not even like acknowledging what by what criteria are things better, right? Yeah, it doesn't discuss the standard by which we by which we're measuring. It just it just measures whatever standards available to it at the time. Right, and I think this crosses over into the way we talk about you know politics. Or I, I think the most interesting scenario was um, I don't really give a shit about talking about it anymore. But um, a, a colleague of mine, you know, it was, there was a protest on the the tube or something for Extinction Rebellion or something, and you know they were you know, <laughs> just like stopping people from doing their daily thing, and um, the sort of hand wavy thing was like, oh, but it's for a good cause. It's like what 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 good is this causing? I don't understand. What are you talking about? Well, I think what you're saying is like they're generally expressing publicly some sort of uh, concern about something or other. And there's sure. kind of... <laughs> that, I, I, like, I am down with it. that 100%. But what I'm saying is why is the same sort of general concern that's expressed through a president such as Donald Trump viewed as such a horrific aberration and then some other general concern is viewed as something that's liberating. What's going on there? I think it's just because the first one is just like, we just, it's just acceptable form of progress or something. And the Donald Trump one, you have to kind of think about it to get to it. You have to really think, you have to really take what he's saying. That's in it, it. In and you of have itself. To actually think. Yeah, <laughs> basically. Yeah. God forbid we actually think about things, eh? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this is going to sound elitist, but I mean, the herd is in charge and i don't mean from the from the bottom up i mean from the top up like like the herd like there's no there's no difference anymore between the top and the bottom i mean in in in, in terms of herd like mentality because you know you get you get because like we used to have this cliche of like oh yeah it's like you know uh whatever like you know people at the bottom people have worked that's people who will just assume oh this is my tribe this is my net nation and i'm just going to dogmatically assume this but now you have all of this stuff we were talking about earlier with the culture wars whether it's like the current thing the ukraine flag you have this high up in all of these you know high up bureaucracies academic uh, positions political positions and so on like it, 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 there's a there's a class of of uh of um of of these people who just don't want to think but are but are at the same time in these positions of total responsibility you know as opposed to the traditional herd which is at the bottom and they didn't have that much responsibility anyway right 
And mm-hmm. I, I think that's the difference between like this century and like, you know, whatever, what, what, whatever was going on in the, in the 19th century, for example. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that's an interesting question, whether the elites now actually think about what they're doing or not, whether they're just kind of, you know, dragged into things. But I know, I see a lot of the, I see a lot of like credence in the fact that these people are literally just dragged into these, these, these positions, because you know it's what Nick Land says about capital is that it just, it just <laughs> chews up and reconstitutes everything, you know. Mm. Yeah, I think. I think that um, the question of hierarchies too really comes into this because we don't have a we don't have a measurement to to form a, a, a hierarchy anymore. We just have. So this is, to this assume. is so, sorry to interrupt you, but this is yeah. a really important point because that's the fundamental difference between leftism and rightism. I think is hierarchy, and yeah. basically, um, rightists are not only of the f- like of the opinion that you know hierarchies are inevitable but they're also beneficial to have right and that's fundamentally this is like the reason why i get so pissed off when people call me a conservative because i'm not a conservative in the current like s- like state of things i'm definitely a revolutionary in this current state of things but Like they're they're inevitable. They're they're inevitable. Not only inevitable, but they're also desirable. That's the essence of rightism. The essence of leftism is that of, of egalitarian egalitarianism. I don't really get it. I think it mostly comes from Christianity. To be honest, to be honest with you, but um, yeah, I'm kind of interested in what what your what your thoughts are on that because I'm I'm, I'm that's where my rightism comes from. I'm 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 for hierarchy that is that is like accountable and transparent and honest and inspiring at the same time like like is an embodiment of something better and and isn't just a bureaucratic position. Um, I you know used to be a bit more on the more egalitarian side of things and like I'm I'm for probably a lot of like left wing economic policies. Um, I mean. It, de- it depends on the particularity of it, of course, but ge- in general, I'm kind of probably more of a, you know, on the, econ- on the left the economic side. But when it, comes to this, when it comes to the social stuff, I think, for example, have you ever dealt with a institution or a company which is based on this idea of like, there's no bosses, we're just all this equal, we're kind of, we're kind of this equal middle management class that runs everything. As soon as anything goes wrong, you have no one to hold the p- person who's done the wrong thing accountable. Because there's no boss to go to. So if, if so, like let, let's say you're dealing with a phone company, for example, and the phone company is uh, is like there's no bosses here. We're just a kind of a democratic. Uh, we're we're a democratically controlled institution. It's like okay, well, one of your democratically controlled leaders has double charged me this month, and I've tried to contact them and they won't respond. So who can I speak to to get this person in trouble so that they can't do this? Because this is unfair on me. There is no one to speak to. You know what I mean? Because there's no one above them to hold them accountable mm-hmm. to anything. So I kind of think that um, I kind of think that uh, uh, and you hear stories about people dealing with universities like this. The whole, even though universities do have a hierarchical structure, but like there's generally a kind of disposition of more democratic um, uh, tolerance and so on for like a lot of the administrative staff. And like uh, if you, I, I I think that the the what's happening is that the general leftist attempt at equalization and, and, and democratizing institutions um, is not driven towards a, a fundamental desire to you know stop exploitation and corruption, but it's an excuse to exploit and corrupt because you no longer have any sense of responsibility. Because I think hierarchy does come along often, at least it should, um, with a sense of responsibility. It reminds me of you know, Christopher Lash's book, Revolt of the Elites, which is based a lot on the fact that uh, the the elites want to be liberated from any sense of duty towards their country or any sense of duty towards their people or any sense of duty towards a family, for example, and so on. They, they want to be liberated from this. Um, so I think that, yeah, I'm deeply suspicious now these days of this, uh, of this egalitarian um, leveling, actually, because I think it's, it's, 
it's 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 an excuse to be even more ruthless capitalists and exploiters than the standard hierarchical form of that yeah i think you're right i mean <laughs> to be honest with you i think this is your leftism coming out you know i feel like you know you you see these things as you know an excess of egalitarianism but i see it as the opposite it's a deferral of responsibility well that's what i think it is too i think it's, it's and, fundamental. And this, yeah. is, this is what i'm saying is like you know the the the, the thing about rightism is it sounds horrible on the surface because it's all about hierarchy and position all this sorts of stuff but those positions come with where they should normatively come with the responsibility you know mm. and um you know capital has been so good at just dissolving all existing social bonds and hierarchies that it's you know become incredibly good at deferring responsibility just to some generic, you know, even before computers were a thing, like like artificial intelligence of the market, for example. Um, and yeah. writism, you know, I mean, we can talk about all the, you know, the trad posting, all that bullshit. But basically what writism is about is about, you know, deferring it to actual people. Yeah. That's what I think anyway. But that's my own brand of writism. So there you go. I mean, <laughs> so, yeah, I think the um, I remember when in COVID, when um, when a, a gross mistake was made, um, you know, for example, we're going to shut down all these these departments of hospitals and we're going to shut down the schools and we're going to shut down blah, 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 because there's going to be a new wave of COVID or something. And then when it, yeah. well, so we're going to shut down the hospitals during a health crisis. Yeah. Mm. But OK, and, cool. Like, yeah. Nice one. Fuck when no. when they got it wrong they never said oh sorry we fucked up they said that we didn't have enough data at the time to make the right decision <laughs> like blame the data you know blame your lack of data is what i'm saying like i thought this was a really interesting obfuscation they were constantly making we didn't have enough data at the time because it 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 suggests you know when we do get more data we'll be we'll be in a proper position to take responsibility and of course, it never comes because you're always collecting data. You, you can collect data until the cows come up, you know? This is the issue. This is the issue. This is the problem with the, um, you know, the continuing eschatology of these things is that there is an end state which Fukuyama, like, put forward that is the end of history. Like, it doesn't... Once we have enough data, then we'll know everything. We don't have to think about anything ever again. It will be deferred to like algorithms, all this sort of stuff, right? Yeah, but even Fukuyama is um, like if you read him, like he's actually he's actually a, quite a decent uh, critiquer of a lot of this stuff we're talking about. He just does it from the from the point of view of of liberalism being being it being possible to reform, as opposed to it being just the inevitable conclusion of liberalism itself. Although he does refer to a lot of this stuff as the excesses of liberalism, but then he paradoxically says, he paradoxically goes from the injunction that it's still the only system we have and uh, it can be, it can just kind of be reformed. So anyway, but, um, but yeah, I think that this theme of, uh, of postponing responsibility by way of progress, like postponing responsibility by saying, well, the data isn't here yet, but it will be, and then we'll be able to be fully responsible. Um, these problems are here now, but when we, when we progress past them and we will eventually be in this end of history state, then they won't be. There, there is a constant deferral theme that's going on at the moment with, with the way we think historically. And I think it is, it could be, it could be based around just a constant obfuscation of any, of any political responsibility to anything. So yeah, to kind of wind back around, when it comes to the self-publishing thing, um, I don't really feel any personal shame when it comes to self-publishing. Um, I think that traditional publishing has had its day the same way that, you know, a record label has had its day as well. Um, when it, when, so, so when it comes to publishing things right now, let's just have a look at how they come come down to like the, the brass tacks, right? So if you wanna if you want to publish a book um, with a traditional publisher, 
you'll go through um, hell trying to get it like copywritten, all this sort of stuff. Um, I'm of the understanding that my book actually has some spelling errors in it. So whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know. Uh, it doesn't have that many. It's got a few, but it's, it's not, it's not bad. Yeah, that's because I just like read it back myself a couple of times and then published okay. it. Okay, so <laughs> you edited everything yourself, yeah? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, basically, it's the same as like, you know, putting out an album. It's, it's just like, basically, publishing companies are so strapped right now that unless you can essentially publicize yourself, there's no point in them doing it, so they won't do it. You know, it's, yeah. it's a simple economic question. Like, um, and, you know, unless you literally have a viral hit and you're Jordan Peterson and you can get your all like adverts on the tube, like, there's no point in doing any of that sort of stuff. There's no point. You'll, wait, you'll waste decades of your life trying to do that sort of stuff. Well, so. that's the thing. It's, it's a waste of time even trying. I've got a friend who's trying to, he's trying to get a, a book. Like, a, like he's, he, he writes like fictional stuff, like a kind of fancy fiction. And he's uh, going through the mainstream. He's got like an agent and he's going through the mainstream publishers. And I was kind of saying to him, like, why don't you consider just doing it yourself online? And he was like, no, I want to do, the old, do it the old school way. And I was kind of thinking like, wow, like how many years are you going to spend trying and trying and trying? And it could be hopeless. It could be for nothing. Right. I mean, I'm not saying it's for everyone. Uh, it's definitely for me because, I mean, like I said, Missing Action came out like eight months ago. And my opinions and my mental worldview has changed so much since then. You know, like what, mm. like uh, maybe that's just my age, but you know, like things are changing. You know, um, but basic, basically, you know, with a with a traditional publisher, you'll get paid like you know in advance, which is like oh, cha ching, whatever, like ten thousand, twenty thousand pounds, or whatever, and <laughs> which is for anyone who works a normal job like I do. <laughs> that's fucking nothing basically <laughs> um and yeah you know like you you put out the book and whatever but like um i'd much rather have the continuous like input that i have from what i'm doing right now um you know every couple of weeks or so i get a notification in my email saying oh this person bought missing axioms. Like that's really like meaningful to me. And, you know, uh, I'm on a platform called Gumroad, which is a really great platform. Um, you know, and I get like, of every, of every like $10 books sold, I get like $9 of it. So that's like, I can't even imagine what that would be like compared to like a traditional publisher. Cause you know, you get your advance and, you know, you don't even get paid until, you know, 10,000 or a thousand books are sold. And most books don't even sell that many. Yeah. Well, I so mean, that's what I'm doing right now. So there you go. <laughs> do, do you think there's a, there's a kind of, there's a problem with the, the publishers and the producers, if you talk about music as well. Um, they, on one hand, it seems like it is about money, but I mean, okay. So like what I was thinking about recently was, um, why did film producers stop making good films and the like because because i think there was a period in like the late 90s or early 2000s where for some reason you just had loads of loads of producers and loads of people with money who are willing to invest in something risky they were willing to risk they were willing to invest in something that may not pay off but had but had some sort of like substantial worth to it in a kind of greater sense beyond money although money was deeply involved and um that doesn't seem to be around anymore. I think what people do nowadays, I think what used to happen was this, right? It kind of fits into our theme of hierarchies and the um, niches and so on. But is that there used to be, uh, uh, so like the creator would create and then out of a kind of universal market, a niche would then, would then be inspired by the creator and then move towards the creator. And I think that and then th that would be your market. And I think that what happened is that eventually those markets became so rigid that, for example, now, if you want to do something, you no longer create a new niche. You uh, just follow a pre-existing one, which is why they're making like Fast and Furious 125 
because there's already there's already a market there. It's like why why do you need to take the risk and make it and make a new niche or so on and so on? Like just just use the ones that are already there. You already have this pre existing infrastructure of marketing. So I think that's the reason why there's no creativity in, in all of these producers and publishers because they just have these niches and they're like, well, we're not going to go outside of the, lo- the the boundaries of these niches because it's why why bother? You know, everything's mapped out. It's kind of like geography. It's like everything's mapped out. There's no, there's no need to explore. Everything's already mapped. It's fine. Like, yeah, I don't know. I think this is why. Um, you know, I'm not a Christian, but I you know I'm kind of a, the pin. You know, the good guys will win because. The fact that Penguin has to placate uh, people like Jordan Peterson, um, you know, that's like a that's like a point in our in our in our favor. You know, it's, it, we're going to win. The, the thing about the um, uh, 1990s and the early 2000s is you, you you need to think about these things because that's the time when the Soviet Union fell, and that's the time when the West was like unquestionably dominant like completely dominant like there's no question whatsoever and now there's actually a question there's actually a question whether the west is actually dominant and this is why you have paranormal activity seven or what the fuck are they doing now you know? <laughs> and apparently the people that are consuming these crap films are the chinese apparently uh that's the main market they're actually making them more for the chinese population nowadays than they are for the for the actual Western population who don't bother to use films anymore. Like this, yes. no and this is the this is the thing is is like just like everything else that's Western, the Chinese will eventually work out how to do the same thing. Yeah. And we will lose our edge, basically. <laughs> yeah. We will keep making paranormal activity seven until the Chinese work out how to make paranormal paranormal activity eight, you know. <laughs> Yeah, this is it's like <laughs> decline of the West uh, through cinema. Fast and Furious, one hundred and twenty-four, Paranormal Activity, seventy-five. It's no longer scary. You expect the jumps to happen. Nothing, nothing. Uh, yeah, you know who's going to win the race. It's one hell of a tailor, so I tell you that. <laughs>